What's up, everyone? We're about three weeks away from the 2016 United States presidential election, and it's got me thinking about voting and about the state and all kinds of things. So I want to share some of my thoughts with you guys. First off, I really want to illustrate the fact that states, the concept, the idea of this institution um, that runs governments and controls masses of people in a geographical landmass, this idea that a group of men and women and individuals, elite groups of people, maintain monopoly on the law and on force and taxation and a number of other things, that very idea itself is, is a cult. It is, you know, a religion. Um, Larkin Rose said it best with his book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, talking about statism. And I think it's important to recognize that just like any cult or any religion, the state, they have their holy places, their holy rituals, and their sacraments, you know, like the Pledge of Allegiance, the uh, anthem, all these different things that we're expected to stand up and to, to sing proudly and to hold your hand over your heart and to show respect and the military, all these various institutions. The cult, and the cult of America, one of the biggest rituals is voting. You know, voting is another area where the Americans, and I don't think it's just in America, but most people around the world were taught in these places that are, you know, supposedly democracies or constitutional republics or whatever you want to believe, that these places are more free and because of our freedom and our privilege, we should vote because that's what every good free person does. And there's a lot of brainwashing that goes from goes on from birth to the moment you enter the state's institutions, if you were unfortunate enough to enter those state institutions, where they start programming the state's version of history and the state's ideas and you know the state's government. And you grow up thinking that this is the only way that, uh, that the world works or that this view that you're taught is the truth, you know, it's objective truth, which often, as we find out, is not the truth. Um, so this brainwashing goes on and it continues to push this myth that voting itself is an act of empowerment, that this is something we should be proud of. Now, whenever you talk about, when people talk about non-voting or non-voting as an action, as a strategy, not out of apathy, people often shoot back and talk about, you know, women's suffrage. They talk about uh, minorities being unable to vote and women being able, unable to vote. And obviously those were, you know, there was different times. There was horrible treatment to, uh, to blacks and to foreigners in the United States and to women. And a lot of that continues to this day. But the act of voting, giving these groups of people the act of voting, was simply a charade designed to give them the belief that they were participating. Now, you are a part of the club. Now you can help pick which slave master you want. You can pick certain things, um, especially when it comes to the presidential race. I will say that there are some examples that many people you know, can bring to my attention that local voting will have an impact and, and can have an impact. I can, I can understand that argument. But I also, at the same time, think that voting in itself legitimizes this system, this system that doesn't care about us, you know. It doesn't care about the wars, about launching wars of aggression, the drug war, all these various problems. Politicians and individuals can promise things and they can run for office and say that they're going to change or fix this or that. Uh, but ultimately they're just one individual and they cannot change a system that is corrupted and some would say by design to disempower people and to disenfranchise people. So you legitimize that system with your vote. And also the other problem that I have with voting is that People often distance themselves from the personal responsibility of their choices when it comes to voting. So if you choose to vote for a Clinton or for a Trump or a Johnson or a Stein or Obama or a Bush or whoever, you, in a way, own the actions of that person. Now, ultimately, they're responsible for their own actions, and I completely understand and believe that. But by saying that, hey, I am going to put my weight behind this person and go into this ballot box and write their name on a slip or press this button, you are saying you endorse them and their actions. And many people accept that politicians lie when they run for office. And then whenever that politician does get into office and they go back and they prove themselves to be a liar, their supporters will say, hey, well, you know, they can't do everything or they're only one person. Or they'll admit that they expected them to lie. That's just what they do. But all these things are unacceptable for me. I don't want to play that game. I don't want to join in that charade. I have some other videos on voting as an... Uh, as a strategy and why I don't vote, and I'll post those links below if you want to know more about that. But even when we talk specifically about the election in 2016, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, let's look at those candidates. Now, personally, I don't see much to value in either of these people. You know, they're both warmongers. They both will continue the surveillance state. They both have 
uh, you know, a horrible record when it comes to showing that they truly care about the people. Um, Donald Trump on his business dealings doesn't seem to be care about the people. Hillary Clinton and her actions as Secretary of State and things that she supported in Honduras and other places and in Libya. I mean, they're both just, these are not people that I want to be represented by. I don't want to even give them the respect of, of uh, paying them any mind, you know, so I pay as little mind to them as possible. These are the major choices in America today. We have also, you know, Gary Johnson, Joe Stein, these other people that we could vote for. But ultimately, again, I don't think that that is something that I want to support. But when it comes to Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, this is an interesting aspect I've been realizing, is that in some ways, these two characters are representing archetypes that exist within each of us. They're representing the feminine and the masculine. Donald Trump representing this sort of macho, machismo, strongman that some people seem to identify with and that they think is necessary in order to take America back to you know, being great again and, and fixing problems in this country. And I can empathize with people who are seeking a radical change in order to try to, to make things better. And then when it comes to Hillary Clinton, there are people who see her representing of feminine qualities, uh, nurturing, you know, she's playing this grandmother figure up. I don't think this is true, but this is what they're trying to portray her as. Is she's the caring one. She cares about health care. She cares about the working class. She, uh, again, she's a grandmother. Now, obviously, anyone can display feminine and masculine traits, but ultimately, I think that there's this dichotomy that we're seeing, and it's a dichotomy that is within each of us. We each have certain traits of feminine and masculine and maybe somewhere in between there at different times and different situations. But these two archetypes of the feminine and masculine are being used as a way to physically, politically, and I think on a spiritual level, divide us and cause division within ourselves. So there's this pulling apart of feminine going this extreme way and masculine going this way. And that doesn't mean all women support Hillary or all men support Trump. I just mean those qualities. So maybe you identify more with some of those qualities that you, you see in Hillary. So you go that that way and some go this way to Trump but ultimately we're being pulled apart and in that vacuum that space there that's where the state thrives that's where the state is corrupting our being and trying to disempower us and make us believe that voting is the only way or that this system is the only way to, to create change and I think that's important to recognize the elections are just amazingly beautiful times to divide people it's just so disgusting but amazing when you really step back and recognize that we are being divided every four years and even you know even more rapidly every election cycle and we allow that to happen so in this space where the state exists and where we're being pulled apart there's also an opportunity though this is where myself and, and my friends here in Houston and others around the country and around the world are developing a concept of freedom cells we're trying to replace that imbalance that is existing within each of us that the state is exploiting by dividing our masculine and feminine qualities. We're trying to reapply balance through empowering our communities, through mindfulness, through the conscious resistance, and through freedom cells. So we now have a house here and we're trying to show people how to get you know, off the grid and to empower themselves through the counter economy and through non-voting and through action in your local community to empower yourselves. This is an idea that we really think can be revolutionary and can change things around much quicker and, well, I don't want to say quicker, but much more lasting. It might take a few generations, but it's, act it's going to be real change compared to voting for a candidate. I want to issue a challenge. If you do believe that voting for Trump or Clinton or any of these people are going to actually bring you towards a more free society, a more prosperous lifestyle, then take up this following challenge, okay? Go and vote for them. And in 2020, four years from now, if your candidate has been elected, uh, see how much closer you are to your goals. You know, think about what you want out of your life and what you're trying to achieve and what you're hoping to accomplish by voting for a person. And in that same time, we'll be building our freedom cells. And we'll see who is further along and advancing our lives to creating abundance and freedom and community and compassion and empathy and brotherhood in our communities and in our lives. We'll see who gets further along in that process, either by voting or by building within our community. And we challenge you guys to get involved and to start doing things in your own community. If you want to learn more about that, check out freedomcells.org. 
And that, that's all I got to say today. Remember, guys, voting is a ritual. Voting for these people and believing that real change is going to come from there, it's not going to happen. I know many people out there are feeling empowered now and they're thinking, I need to go out and vote now because we have to stop Hillary. There's no jokes this time. This is serious. We have to go out there and stop Trump. You know, one way or the other, people are being taught that this is an important time for them to come be the hero. But you can be the hero now in this moment, in every moment, every day, within your own life and your own community. Don't let these people trick you into believing that their game matters. Remember, you are powerful, you are beautiful, you are free. Peace. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheConsciousResistance.com, TheSeedsOfLiberty.com, and and multiverse network. <laughs> so today we have uh, Derek Bros. Uh, delighted to have him on because I've been part of the Conscious Resistance Network for, for what is it like two years now, like a year and a half or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and only now we're getting into uh, the actual uh, interview and getting to know him. So uh, I think it's been a long time coming. Uh, Derek is a freelance journalist, agorist, free market anarchist an activist in uh, coming out of Houston, Texas. Um, he runs the, the website theconsciousresistance.com, uh, derekbros.contently.com, that's contently.com, um, and also he contributes content uh, on activistpost.com. And Facebook pages include The Conscious Resistance Network, Activist Post, and Psychologic-Anarchist. And we'll, we'll discuss a little bit about how he came to volunteerism, his history with drug addiction, and uh, and his books that he's been uh, co-authoring with John Vibes. Uh, first one was The Conscious Resistance, Reflections on Anarchy and Spirituality. And the second one is Finding Freedom in an Age of Confusion. So, uh, Derek, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate that great introduction. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, really, really happy to have you. I see you like at every Liberty Fest, and uh, you know, you give, give some nice talks. and uh, And I saw your awesome interview with Sterling. Uh, that guy, that guy's been uh, really um, gaining traction with his psychological anarchist. So it's beautiful to see. Um, but uh, but yeah, so please, um, you know, get into a little bit about your history uh, before we get into uh, you know your activism and and the books. Sure, absolutely. Thanks for giving me that opportunity. Um, you know, as far as how I became a volunteerist or agorist or came to be a part of this uh, this loose, large movement, I think my journey specifically started years before I ever looked into libertarian ideas, before I started to study political philosophy or um, even really pay attention to the state of government as it exists today. Yeah, my journey more began through, um, like you said, struggles with drug addiction. Essentially, when I was a teenager, I had you know I was dealing with a, a lot of trauma that I wasn't I hadn't come to a place yet where I had the tools or I was capable enough to process these things, and I didn't feel like I had the people around that allowed me to communicate these ideas and to um, have a place to safely uh, discuss you know the things that I was feeling, dealing with my relationship to my parents and specifically my father and things uh, related to his drug addiction and growing up around a drug addict and in a family of drug addicts, and um, so. You know, as I as I got older, I started to experiment my own and uh, deal with my depression. My father spent most of my 31 years, 27 out of 31, in prison for his drug addiction and various crimes related to his drug addiction. So he's been absent most of my life, and mm. obviously that played a, a role that I've only really started to understand as I've gotten older. You know, truly understand the role that it played in decisions I made, the way I treated other people, the way I viewed myself. Um, and one of the ways that I processed and dealt with things was through, you know, getting as blitzed as I could on whatever I could, you know, a have access to. And it started with alcohol for a period of time, then, you know, took uh, Xanax and other pills for a little while and ecstasy. And basically it was just hopping around from like one thing to the next. And again, the, uh, the drug use was really a symptom of deeper issues that I just had, didn't have the proper tools at the time to navigate. 
Uh, and eventually, I find, found myself addicted to crystal meth when I was 20 years old, and uh, in a matter of 10 months, you know, went from having a, a, a nice apartment, uh, a, a nice lady, and uh, uh, just a good place in my life to trying crystal meth, and within 10 months was homeless, was locked up in prison, you know, lost everything really quickly, and just went through some some really tough and crazy times for somebody at that age, and I think really anybody of any age, but for me at that time it was really difficult so the week before I turned 21 I was I ended up arrested and um, I did a, a year the first time uh, I got charged with possession of controlled substance for crystal meth um, and I had actually thankfully got to a point where I was able to quit on my own you know when I got arrested for it I wasn't even using it anymore I quit actually about a month before that I was able to you know have the strength to decide like this is not the life I want this is not the direction I want to go to but I was still in the world in the sense of dealing drugs and selling drugs and uh, being around that. So I surrounded myself by those t same type of people. And so ultimately I had drugs on me when I was pulled over one day and I got arrested. So yeah, that began a four-year journey of being going in and out of prison. Um, for the first time was a year. Then I got out and I was on um, probation for a while. They sent me into a treatment center and I was only out for about five months. I, even after a year, I really – I had started to look deeper into – trying to understand myself, like I, I really feel like I saw a vision of my life headed down that path, you know, this path that I'd seen through my father and through you know, his father and things like that and was able to see like, okay, this is a direction you can go. You can take that path or you can try to do something completely new and go in a different direction. And that was really the beginning of this larger awakening process in, you know, in those first moments. Now, of course, I got out and I was only out for five months and I got sent back for another three and I was out for a year and I started mm -hmm. drinking and ended up getting a DWI and getting a felony. So I mean it was a four year period of in and out, back and forth, still gaining lessons this time but ultimately mm -hmm. I was released from the final time from prison after doing 18 months, um, October 2008, so about a month before Obama got elected which was a really time to be kind of coming back into the world uh, mm -hmm. with this. I, I remember this feeling of thinking like, uh, that this Obama guy was either going to save the world or be the Antichrist because people were just obsessed with him. You know, <laughs> I'm just like, I don't understand what's going on. You know, and and in that, you know, that sort of uh, experience coming out of there, I came out of prison as a felon, and um, you know, just had trouble getting a job. And I, I was just I, where I was living. I happened to live next to a library, so I would go to the library every single day and just apply for jobs. I also started to just check out books, and throughout that four year period. I felt like this cloud had been lifted because not only was I getting sober off of these you know, crazy drugs I was putting myself through, but also I, I, I got into meditation. There was um, the first time I got locked up, there was a, a – every weekend in the Houston Chronicle, they have a, a religious section and there's like – they usually have – just different stories relating to religion, but also philosophical beliefs like Buddhism and the Tao and stuff. And they'll have like a, a, a section where they kind of quote different things from the, the belief systems. And there was a quote from the Dhammapada, which is somewhat known as the Buddhist Bible, just a bunch of verses that the Buddha is credited for. And I don't remember what the verse was, but whatever it was, it struck me very hard. And just immediately I wrote to my girlfriend and to my grandmother and started requesting books and just anything I could on Buddhism and meditation, just wanting to know more. And that really began that journey. And so... I, I held with that throughout that whole time period and just started to understand, like I wrote so much while I was locked up. That's really, I think, one of the things that kept me sane. And I really just started to look at my decisions and to question myself and question my motives. So by the time I got out in 2008, my whole life had been completely changed. You know, I was just looking at the world with fresh eyes and then coming out as a felon, I felt like I really felt like I'd been sleeping for the first 20, some, 20 years of my life or so that I was like in this haze of just being a young child that was deeply affected by going and visiting like my father in prison and just seeing these different things that just kind of I felt like it, they made me put put me on hold for a while because I was definitely seriously depressed I had suicide attempts throughout my teenage years and all that led to drug you know drug use and addiction and such and so when I finally got through that I felt like this cloud had been lifted I felt like I remembered I'm an intelligent person and I like to read and so I started I remember I checked out a book on the drug war and that was sort of the the first thread that I pulled, you know, I read about the drug war and I, out of, after just getting out of, you know, prison for drugs, it was really fresh in my mind. So I read this book <clears throat> called Cannabis, A History, which was just all about the sociological impacts of cannabis, the history of itself, of the plant, you know, the science behind it, just great, just really well done work and also helped me see that, you know, the drug war was based on racism and money and like putting hemp out of business and all sorts of things like this. And that was one of the first things that really got me to start questioning um, the actions the government takes. I'd sort of always had an anti-authoritarian, almost you could say anarchist, 
uh, feeling, you know, I grew up getting in trouble, but it wasn't any sort of philosophical backing to it. It was just, I knew things intrinsically were not, you know, I, I didn't care to worship my teachers or the pastor or whatever, simply because they were in that position. And that would be, as a child, you get in trouble when you're like, hey, I'm not just going to bow down to you and respect you mm. or just listen to what you say because you say so. Uh, so, you know, I think that was in, the seed was in me already. I, I, I think that we both probably would agree that most people are born anarchists, but it just sometimes you lose it or you, you forget about it. But it wasn't until I really had the going through drug addiction, getting locked up, and then kind of awakening to myself again that I started to read about the drug war. And then from there, I read a, a book uh, by Jim Mars called Rule by Secrecy, which covers a lot of kind of conspiratorial views of the world. And I also read Revolution, a Manifesto by Ron Paul at the same time. So both of those sort of shaped my view from a philosophical understanding and also from like a conspiratorial side. I felt like I was getting information from these two different sources, but saying the same things essentially. And uh, you know, from there, I just started a a blog, and then eventually a community activist group called the Houston Freethinkers, and have just been at, been at it now for six years. <laughs> awesome! <laughs> I love yeah, I love hearing about people's journeys because it's it's just amazing the diverse backgrounds that we have, and and you know, is it coincidence that we all end up at this? logical conclusion um you know like like i remember one thing that larkin rose said was kind of interesting is that you know you often hear i guess republicans become anarchists or democrats become anarchists but you never hear an anarchist become a republican or an anarchist <laughs> become a democrat <laughs> it's, yeah, you, really, you really don't go back <laughs> like a one-way street <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you, man. It's always cool for me to to talk with other people, like either through interviews or just conversations and to see, even like, for example, I was at Jackalope this past week and just any event like that or New York uh, Anarchy in the NYC or any Liberty Fest, you have all these people united from different backgrounds. Like maybe we don't listen to the same kind of music. We don't mm -hmm. dress the same. We don't like the same kind of movies. Maybe we would never, ever cross paths in any other way except for the fact that we believe in freedom. And so that brings people together in all kinds of ways. And that's just so beautiful. That is like the perfect example of spontaneous exam uh, order and, and just, you know, the anarchy in action and just seeing all these different people and just we're, we're coming together and finding common ground. You know, I really love to see that. Yeah, one of the most succinct ways to describe... Um anarchy and uh, yeah i guess anarchy and volunteerism is um the phrase as you wish you know that we embody that phrase because if you know if we want something uh for ourselves you know the freedom for ourselves then we must grant that same freedom to other people right because people some people don't understand that when you seek to use the state to uh limit the freedoms of other people that eventually those people will seek to use the state to limit your own freedom and and that you know it, there's always this cycle of violence going on all the time that that's people don't like to recognize but um but yeah it's a very simple thing like you said we, you know we, we can have different tastes in music and culture and and food and and you know everything and we can you can still live in harmony it's not a problem <laughs> absolutely it seems like such a a simple simple idea but obviously we understand how pro profound that is to get people to consider and how difficult it is to get people to consider Hey, we can live in balance. We can self-organize. You know, we can find a way to take care of ourselves. But, you know, we we continue to try to do it regardless. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think um, I think one of the best one of the best ways is is to look at in nature. You know, nature I think was one of the best examples of spontaneous. Right? I mean, I guess we are we are products of nature, right? So so you look out in the woods. There is no central agency, no central authority dictating what <laughs> what should grow, what should live, what should die. You know. And somehow there is some sort of some sort of order that happens, and I think that's analogous to to the market, to the economy, in that things get created, right? Um, resources go to where they're needed, and most can be put to the most efficient use. Not because someone is in charge of everything, dictating where everything should go, but because of you know competition, supply and demand, the pricing mechanism. Um, that's just how things happen, <laughs> and, and, and it's just so sad when when there's problems in that. People often blame uh, the free market and then seek a violent government solution, <laughs> which is the complete opposite. Yeah, you know what I want to say about that because I was kind of joking before we started about you know the differentiating the free from the free market, and I know there's some. Um, Libertarians, typically I see it from like left libertarians who, who make that distinction, but I do think that's an important distinction because we see in the mainstream or the dead stream that I like to refer to it as, <laughs> that, um, you know, when, when they 
they often equate what we have right now as like a free market. They say like, yeah. oh, you know, America, right. free market capitalism, whatever. Right. So I think it is important to to define like that what we're working towards is something that we could that would be freed, you know, a freed mm-hmm. market, a truly freed market that mm-hmm. doesn't exist today because people do confl- yeah. I think it's you typically those who aren't educated enough about the topic. Or they're just pushing a, a you know a misrepresentation by saying that what exists today in America or really anywhere where the state exists is a free market, but obviously that's a lie. Yeah, that's and and, and that I think that comes back to the point of um, how important definitions are. Understanding mm-hmm. basic terminology, you know, when you when you are, d- are having a discussion with somebody, and they throw out terms like you know capitalism is responsible for all the problems in the world. Look at all the poverty, human suffering, you know, corporations, you know, destroying the planet and you know raping the earth and all this kind of stuff. How can you be? How can you support that? Are you serious? Is that what you want? That's what you want more of? <laughs> and, and then if, before you even before you even answer that, you got to be like, hold on, wait, 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 wait. How do you define capitalism? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, dude, I, you remind me of this. If you don't mind, I'd like to share a story before we get into sure, everything else. Sure. I was at the RNC a couple of weeks ago um, reporting for Activist Post and just, you know, covering the protest outside, et cetera. And I was, I was just telling a friend today how I'm glad I took the trip because I think it's important for those people who are out there paying attention to those things. But at the same time, you know, I'm not concerned with the circus inside the arena, so I wasn't really paying attention to whatever's going on inside. We all know like Trump was going to be the nominee and Clinton was going to be the nominee. So there's no reason to really pay attention to what's going on in, at the indoor circus. But outside <laughs> was equally a circus. And it reminded me of Occupy in a lot of ways. And not in both in the sort of, I guess, the good and the bad ways as far as some of it would just seem like, okay, people are just hanging out in the park. Like what the hell is, you know, revolutionary or, you know, what about this? How is this going to defeat whatever everybody's concerned about? You had all sorts of people some of them wanted to end poverty, some of them wanted to end capitalism, some of them just wanted to end the Republican Party, some of them were de- Democratic uh, Party supporters, others were anarchists of various you know, types, uh, others were Trump supporters out there to debate people. So it was, a, it was an interesting mix of people and there was like the Revolutionary Communist Party which is essentially a cult for Bob Avakian. It's not even, I wouldn't even consider it to be a, a real anarchist thing at all, I mean communist thing at all. Even the other communists don't like them basically. <laughs> <laughs> but there had a lot of protests, and they were, so there was just this broad mix of people, right? And there was marches happening throughout the day, and there was protests going on. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm sitting there watching, and these marches, there's maybe a few hundred people going through the streets. But you know, when the cops say, "Okay, take a left here," "Okay, take a right here," "Okay, go back to the park," you know, they all listen. And I'm not saying that you know they should like, "Okay, screw the cops," start smashing things or whatever. But just in general, watching the idea, okay, these people have probably loftier goals than, hey, let's march through the streets all day and come back to the park. I think they're actually trying to achieve change, right. even if that isn't necessarily what I want. I do think that they want some type of real change. And so what my goal was is after a while, I'm like, okay, I can only get so many days of here's some more people marching on the street. Here's some more people marching and yelling at cops. Like here's a, <laughs> a flag. You know, I want people to think deeper than just that. So I got some of that. But then the last couple of days I was there, I really focused on getting men on the street interviews and just, and not even really interviews, I would say, but just filming conversations, either conversations I was having with people or just other conversations that I witnessed. And uh, one of the nights, man, I really just had an awesome, profound conversation with a literal flag-waving anarcho-communist who was holding his red and black flag hmm. um, had a mask on. And then there was like an older guy who was like a, it's kind of like a labor unionist, definitely a left uh, wing, but not nearly as far as uh, the ANCOM and myself. And we just, and I didn't film it at all because it just felt like it was just a good conversation. There was no reason to kind of ruin it by pulling out the camera and right. be like, let me film this. Right. But it was just one of the most powerful conversations I had because between the three of us, we were able to kind of get past the the sort of knee-jerk reaction and actually get to definitions like you were talking about the importance of and get into the nuances of these various philosophies, you know, and the anarcho-communist was, you know, willing to kind of hear some of what the labor union guy is saying and like hear my opinions and we we're all kind of hearing what each other says and getting past the, the um, essentially what I consider to be the meme culture that has been created by Facebook and by the internet in general where people are so used to posting memes making fun of ANCOMs or ANCAPs or whatever it is that they think is the opposite dogma that they believe in mm-hmm. and not really even in my experience ever actually reading them like you know mm-hmm. the ANCOMs don't typically read Rothbard and I don't know that many uh, you know ANCAP Rothbardians who've read Kropotkin or you know others like that so you have people arguing past each other typically or like you said like maybe one of them's got a different definition of capitalism so you're defending something while they mean something completely different 
and you're just talking over the, all over that place. But it was just a really inspiring about 30 or 45 minute conversation where we were all able to see common ground that each of us had and each of us, you know, shook each other's hand at the end. And I think each of us went away feeling like, wow, that was, that was awesome. That was powerful. Like, you know, I don't a hundred percent, like we may have different solutions, you know, on different things, but we were able to find the areas where there was tons of common ground and sort of look around and watching some people literally like in each other's face, like they're about to beat each other up, you know, and just, <laughs> and that's to me, it's, it is again, the symptom of the social media, the Facebook discussion. People are so used to just like posting a snarky comment or just some meme or whatever. And they're like, when they get in front of somebody's face, they literally act like that. They're just like, ah, like screaming and going, or they just walk away. And, and so it's just this crazy circus. So it was nice to, within all that kind of kind of be outside of it a little bit and just have this really powerful conversation. So I say all that to say to the, the viewers and the listeners that please be willing to have conversations with other people because I don't think we're going to get towards any more free, conscious, empowered uh, world without being willing to have communication, you know, and especially with the people who we we quickly label as our enemy or as our opposite, as the other in our mind. You know, we need to get past that state of mind. And there are very strong differences in certain beliefs you know obviously that separate us and you know those when those times come those bridges will be crossed but there's also so much common ground that could be focused on and relationships that could be cultivated that might end up bringing us to some point closer you know mm. to a real free world rather than continuing the division because it's just frustrating to see how easily so many people are divided you know within the mainstream world with the left and the right and the democrats and republicans but even outside of that people who are anti-statist or you know they want something deeper freedom even among those movements there's a lot of division so I just I want to get past that and I had a great time trying to make that you know part of my goal being there rather than focusing on the circus of it all yeah that's a really great point I um reminds me of a post I did uh maybe last sometime last year um and it was basically um bashing uh, anarcho-communism <laughs> and and i used to like when i first started i used to identify very strongly with you know as an anarcho-capitalist specifically um and, and and you know if you pin me down i guess i really would but now i i kind of backed up and i kind of have realized that you know really i think the main goal is um you know is just anarchy in general right just yeah. live and let live right just you know no one has a right to rule any, anyone else and if people can can uh, come together in a community and call it you know and it be more like a commune a commune or an eco village what's really wrong with that there's nothing really wrong with that or if if people want to have a worker owned co-op what's really wrong with that nothing you know if it's if there's nobody being injured or harmed and if it's you know basically all voluntary you know, I don't really have a problem with that. Um, and, and people can choose to live the way they want to live. So so I think that's more important. You know, I agree with you that the idea of uh, that's why I like voluntarism and agorism, I guess it's just they're, they're more general terms. Um, and, you know, if, if but, but, you know, if you were to say, you know, well, which which system do you think would lead to more prosperity? Well, then I guess that's more of like a, a utilitarian argument, like, you know, which would be more successful. But for, but for now, I think I think what's the most important, what's the, you know, the largest beast that we have to slay is statism. The idea of the belief in authority, you know, the state, that's the biggest beast. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, you know, if you're talking about state communism, all right, that's a huge beast. But we're talking about anarcho communism. You know, that's a that's more or less a voluntary thing so i don't have a problem with that and and you're right like they read different books right so so i got put it's, in my place okay i just because I, I got put it in my place when i made that post and after that i'm like all right i can't i can't bash communi anarcho communism anymore i will say this you know because they are this is what we have to recognize is you know you only have so much time in, in the day right there's a lot of people out there who are right. rothbardians to the core you know they've read everything that rothbard read and everybody right. who was influenced by rothbard and they try to carry on those traditions that takes a lot of time just to read all that information but we have to recognize is that you know and this is, was the point of my speech that I gave last year at um, Anarchy and NYC was kind of calling for unity and for these alliances of radicals of all types, you know, anti-authoritarian, anti-status radicals of, across the spectrum who just can recognize that. And it really is kind of a harken back to the anarchists without adjectives, anarchists mm -hmm. without hyphens right. um, movement, which has been around for hundreds of years of um, anarchists and various volunteers saying, hey, you know, instead of spending all of our time dividing ourselves into various economic camps about what we are going to do if we ever get there, why don't we just work towards the, the goal of getting there, you know, and then let free people decide at that point, you know. Mm. And that's also, I think, how you can uh, really distinguish between who, um, I, I don't want to say is worthy, but who can actually fit the 
definition of an anarchist, and that is who is voluntary. Because I will say I definitely have met others who would call themselves anarcho-communists, but also weren't for volunteerism. But then I've met anarcho-communists, and I've read some of what Kropotkin has written. And when I read it, I'm like, okay, wow, this is like nearly identical language to volunteerism. And mm. he just has different uh, school of thought on you know his economics, mm -hmm. but he ha he still it wasn't calling for you know anybody to be forced into the system or to have a state to enforce it or whatever. So mm. I just think it's it's important to get past that. And I definitely, like you said, I I have I guess that's why I shy away from the a lot of the labels and stuff and if anything anarchist the adjectives to me also agorist agorism is a agorist is a good identifier um, and I, I stand by that philosophy and I, I definitely and counter economics is a strategy that I live you know on a regular basis so I have no problem identifying with that and also because I feel like you could be an anarcho communist and practice counter economic activity you know you could mm -hmm. still recognize hey we're gonna have a commune but we want to take power away from the state so we're gonna try to do it in the black gray markets or we're gonna try to create um, you know, some kind of free bank system or, you know, some mutualist system or whatever they want. And it could still be done outside of the current state and without force and without uh, robbery to other people. You know, in the same regard, you know, anarcho-capitalists obviously appreciate agorism and counter-economics. You know, mm. you, could, you could put that in any school. And that's why I, I like it as well as I try to get others to be like, look, you don't have to. Yes, it was written in a New Libertarian Manifesto. And yes, the guy who wrote it was influenced by Rothbard. A lot of people who employ the tactic are consider themselves anarcho-capitalists, but you could be of any school of thought and see it as a valuable strategy. And I think that is empowering, you know, because it gives some, it gives people a tool that they can use no matter what they want to identify with. You know, like that's cool. Look, you recognize that the Federal Reserve is a problem, that the, the currency is manipulated and uh, monopolized. Well, agorism gives you a tool. Counter-economics gives you a strategy to get out of that situation. You remind me of a uh, a picture I saw someone post of uh, of a bumper sticker on somebody's car, and it's like, um, um, my my agorist kid sells weed to your honor student kid. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and, awesome. and then it's like, and then you see the agorist father like tapping the as agorist son. That's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, yes. Yeah, Wait, say it again. I said I have to get myself that bumper sticker. <laughs> yeah, it really made me laugh. Um, but yeah, but yeah, agorism. Um, yeah, when I when I tell people what I do in my podcast, uh, so, you know, the way I describe my podcast, I say, I, you know, I talk about uh, universal morality, peaceful parenting, unschooling, homeschooling, um, and um, and agorism and counter economics, and and so a lot of people say, well, what's agorism? So you know, basically, the way I describe it is. Um, you know, transacting outside of the state, raising your kids outside of the state, um, having businesses outside of the state, you know, basically just living your life outside of the state and in that, and, and prospering and thriving and in that way um, slowly starving uh, the beast. And I think that's one of the best ways that, you know, basically it's like peaceful noncompliance, you know. You know, you're, you're, you're not hurting anybody. Um, you're just engaging in voluntary interaction. That is, by the way, unapproved by the state. Incidentally, <laughs> um, but it's beautiful because you're still living and you're still thriving. And uh, and, and how can that be a crime to thrive? Is, is that, isn't that a strange thing? Yeah, it is funny how um, you know the the promotion of just people doing business is has become illegal or illicit or looked on in some bad ways. It, it was it was just funny, and I, I'm always enjoy being around people who have this mindset because people will kind of joke like, "Did you get a permit to do that?" Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the, the amount of things that the state wants you to be permitted to right. do or have permission to change your your state of mind or alter your consciousness or whatever it is is right. just once you really start to understand those things, it, you can really see the ridiculousness of the idea of the state. Right. Telling people how to live their lives in general. Exactly. So please, uh, please get into your your first book, um, the Conscious Resistance: Reflections on Anarchy and Spirituality, and uh, and what that's about, and uh, you know what inspired you to write, or you and John to write it. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, this is definitely uh, the so the, the the idea of the Conscious Resistance first came to me in uh, 2012, the summer of 2012. I, you know, as I was saying earlier, I got out of uh, lockup in 2008. About a year later, I got off parole in 2009, and in 2010, I started the Houston Freethinkers blog, and then that summer, about six years ago, we started having regular meetings and just been involved in all sorts of ways around Houston, um, you know, community gardening, confronting local politicians, you know, uh, doing benefit shows, raising money for charity, protests, whatever, we, whatever felt necessary at the time, we would use this sort of collective community to, and this name, this idea to do that. 
And I also, obviously, as I mentioned before, was into meditation and kind of had this spiritual interest and the spiritual side to my life. And I was involved in spiritual uh, groups, meditation groups, things like that. But I'd always kind of kept that separate from my activism and, you know, my views on politics, even though internally I felt like they were part of the same thing, that the reason I was trying to make the world a better place was because I had this beautiful spiritual change and I wanted to help other people when I wanted, you know, and at the same time I was recognizing the uh, disgusting actions of the state and, you know, the conspiracy among men to control free people and was just really determined to, to help spread that information. So in 2012, after a couple of years of doing that, I just had a couple of nights where you know I was kind of going through another tumbling down the rabbit hole. I spent a few days just researching. I didn't sleep for a few days and was just like going at it, just watching videos and just researching more and more. It felt like I was awakening for the first time again, you know, just where you spend all the nights like watching documentaries and trying to inform yourself. And by the end of that sort of three or four day, you know, adventure, I this the term the conscious resistance came to me and I kind of just realized like I can no longer separate these two sides to myself. You know, I need to bring this together. And so I started the Conscious Resistance uh, website originally just as a way to differ differentiate my specific views from the Houston Freethinkers because uh, you know there's no structure, no hierarchy, no organization officially in the Houston Freethinkers. Everybody just comes and you know I started the group but I don't have any more power or say than anybody else. You know, everybody just comes and is involved. So I didn't want it to be taken like my personal views to be taken as like speaking for the Houston Freethinkers. So I wanted to create something new. And that led to the creation of the Houston Free Thing, or the, of the Conscious Resistance, and the idea of that. And then, fast forward a, a little bit later that year, I interned with Adam Kokesh uh, when he was still doing Adam versus the Man. Like right after he left RT, he was living in the Washington D.C. area and was just broadcasting a show five days a week from his home studio. And so there was four or five of us who lived in the house with Adam. We worked on the show, writing, editing mm -hmm. it, and just, I learned a whole lot through that process. And the synchronicity of the universe worked out. And one night, one of the housemates asked if I wanted to go see a show, some local show. And so I said, sure. I went and checked it out. And John Vibes, who is the writer and my co-author from Maryland, he happened to be the ride to the show. And we went out that night. And John and I ended up pretty much just kind of hanging out away from everybody else and talking about anarchy and shamanism and spirituality all night and hmm. realized that we had these really unique interests and we're seeing things in a similar light. And so that kind of began a, a working relationship of – me having John on my podcast every now and then to talk about these issues and us sort of just developing this conversation. Um, and then I spoke in Anarchy in the NYC in 2013, April 2013, and that was the first time I spoke publicly about my views on spirituality and anarchism because obviously you got people like Molyneux and Kokesh and others who are openly and strongly atheists and kind of closed off to any sort of um, belief system or anything outside of, you know, strict libertarianism, maybe. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, that just didn't apply to me, you know, and I knew other people, obviously, John felt the same. And we were starting to meet other people as we talked about it, who felt like, hey, I have spiritual interests, or I have, you know, views about consciousness or whatever that don't necessarily fit into this atheist kind of rationalist, uh, strict reductionist mindset. And I also am an anarchist, and I also am a libertarian, you know, etc. So I spoke about it then at the first time publicly and was we got a great response. Like I remember being very nervous and telling John, like, all right, this is it. I'm going to come out of the closet as a spiritual anarchist and see how people will respond. Mm -hmm. And immediately got questions about meditation and just people who were looking for more information. And then John came and stayed with me in Houston for a week in 2013. And after that, we pretty much – came up with an outline for what became the first book and realized like, oh, God, we got a book's worth of material here. And that led to the first book, which is now going to be a trilogy. The, the book is called The Conscious Resistance, Reflections on Anarchy and Spirituality. And we got a really just epic, humbling review from Jeffrey Tucker, who is somebody that we both respect, who I would contacted him while we were writing. And I was like, hey, you know, would you be interested in reviewing this? I'd interview him one, one time before. And he was busy, but you know, a couple months passed, and John and I finished it. I remember the morning we finally finished it, and felt like everything was done and like edited, you know, pretty close where we were ready to share it with other people. I just sent it to Jeffrey like in the middle of the night that we'd finished, and by that morning, like three hours later, he'd responded and had already read the book, and was, you know, <laughs> was really really appreciative of it. So I, I was like, oh my god, can we use that? And then he was like, here, use this for a quote. And then, <laughs> you know, so that was kind of that was obviously a huge boost to us, and we released that in April two thousand fifteen at the Free Your Mind conference in Philadelphia. And uh, that was, it's been, it's been well received. The book is, both books um, are available to download for free at theconsciousresistance.com slash books. 
and you can order a physical copy if you like them. But yeah, they're available for people who want to just get that information and you know print it out or share it with their friends. And essentially, what we look at, you know, what what the contrast resistance has evolved to is the the name for our specific message of recognizing the moment an individual recognizes that the struggle and the fight for freedom does not end in the physical realm. That there is also the internal tyrant to to uh, to deal with and to take on. There is also you know each of our own insecurities and doubts and fears that we pick up along our life, you know, through experience and through environment and whatever that we do in our life that affects each of us differently. And, and also, as I said, with my drug addiction, it shows itself differently. Not everybody, you know, deals with their traumas by using drugs. Others have other ways to escape and to process things. And most of them are not usually healthy ways. So what we're essentially saying is that until we do that deeper healing that each of us need to do, it does not matter whether we use an agra system, whether, you know, whatever, we, whatever model we put out there, until we as individuals also can conquer our own demons and can conquer our own internal tyrant and can heal in that way, we're more than likely going to re revolve and have a true revolution going in circles to create something much worse. I mean, I, I don't know what the world would look like with a bunch of ego-filled anarchists running it, but I doubt it's <laughs> something that we want to experience, you know. <laughs> so our goal is through these books and through this idea is just to touch on everything from the book talks about like the first four chapters, I think, are the kind of the core of our message, which is like, what is the conscious resistance? And then uh, we lay out a position of what that we call explorative agnosticism, which is essentially taking an agnostic view of the world, of God, of those large questions, and of almost of reality itself, because there's so much about our world that we truly don't know. Science obviously has done an amazing job, but there's so much that we don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's it would be egotistical and silly, we think, to assume that we have it all figured out, which is what sometimes some anarchists and some individuals in these movements can come across as. And we're more than willing to say, hey, we don't have the answers. We should remain open and skeptical and uh, you know, willing to, to dig for things, even those that may seem out of the realm of possibility, because our awareness and our experience goes beyond just the five sense world, you know, just the physical world. There's much more to who we are as people than that. Um, and then the third uh, chapter starts to look into um, anarchism. We talk about like the history of anarchism itself and then the ideas that we sort of find ourselves um, believing in and aligning with and just how that comes together. And then throughout the book, we also look at the importance of staying in touch with your inner child. We talk about, uh, we, there's one chapter called Conscious Healing that looks on a various a number of uh, modalities for healing from psychedelic therapy to floating therapy to meditation itself, different types of meditation just to conversation. So we're looking at various tools that maybe the anarchist-minded, philosophical-minded haven't considered. And the goal with the, the book and with these series is, like I was saying before, I run in these two different worlds, maybe individuals who are spiritually aware. They, you know, they think about the, dip, the big, deep questions, but sometimes they don't want to hear about politics. They don't want to hear about philosophy because it's too heavy for them. And they think that you know, by focusing on the bad, they're, they're creating the bad, right? So they don't want to focus on that. Then you've got the anarchist kind of philosophical-minded people who are sometimes closed off to a spiritual world or to uh, exploring their own mind and their own heart in these ways. So we wanted to bridge the gap between these two worlds by trying to bring these topics together. And the book continues to go in that realm. I also share a uh, more extended, detailed version of my uh, addiction story and all the things I went through to get, you know, basically what I shared with you, but a little more in detail. And um, you know, we, a few more topics. And in the second half of that first book actually looks at anti-authoritarian traditions and religion um, throughout the world. You know, before, basically before the state, what we see is that religious institutions and state institutions have always worked to control people both in the spiritual sense of the mind and in the physical realm. Mm -hmm. um, and before the religious institutions, the priestly class were established and then started working in tandem with the state, individuals were able to interpret the world as they chose, you know, and it, then along came these priests who said only through saying our prayers or by reading our books or coming to our churches can you know God or can you know enlightenment, can you know the universe, you know, and they tried to monopolize that connection. And so we're trying to take that back and we look at um, a anarchism in Christianity, anarchism in Islam, anarchism in uh, the Tao, anarchism in Buddhism and shamanism and just show how there these traditions, these connections, the origins of them are largely anti-authoritarian and had anti-authoritarian strains in them. Hmm. Um, and then we also, we end the book with looking at uh, Zomia, which is covered in the book, The Art of Not Being Governed, really great book, but we just kind of take a brief look at this landmass that was in, in Asia, doesn't 
it never was there was never a place called Zomia, but it was the name given to this kind of contiguous landmass in East Asia that was essentially made up of, of autonomous anarchist communities, anti-state communities that purposely developed culture and traditions that were anti-statist because they lived up in the mountains, you know. So obviously the idea of some people from down in the city coming and telling them how to live was just complete you know, it was just ridiculous to them. <laughs> and we use that as an example to say, look, here's people that live, that developed a culture and ideas that were not about the state and that were able to live this way. And we kind of, you know, end the book with that. And then about six months after John and I finished that, we met up again and did some more talking. And we realized that we had more to say and that we thought that this, we think this book has now become a trilogy. So we released book number two in April of this year, also at the Free Your Mind conference. And that book is called Finding Freedom in an Age of Confusion. And it's also available for download. And the way I try, I've been distinguishing these books and um, explaining them to people is that whereas book one, we consider it to be more of like the body of our philosophy. It covers a lot of ground. You know, it's introducing people to a lot of new ideas. And we, we dive deeper in some of them than others. But really, like we say in there, this is just to kind of broach the conversation. We don't claim to be the final word on any of these topics or of spirituality and anarchy. We, we want to get this conversation going. Um, so that's the body that like, looks at all these wide range of ideas. The second book, Finding Freedom in Age of Confusion, is more the emotional center. It's the heart. Like These are uh, appealing to people's emotional center in the sense that these essays are written for people in that state of mind that I think each of us may spend a different amount of time in. It's, it's kind of like the grieving process like we discuss in the, in the book. But when you start to question the nature of not only the state but reality itself and the way that you see government and all these, you have to start relearning and unlearning all these things that you've been taught in your life. You can go through periods of confusion, alienation, depression, anger. It's almost like this model for the state of grieving you know, that people mm -hmm. go through. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of use that as the model of saying like we're basically grieving the fact that we've woken up to the world that the, largely the world is a lie you know what I mean so mm -hmm. you have to learn to deal with that so these essays they go from uh, first dealing with your relationship with yourself and they're you know they're really about empowerment and kind of uplifting you and helping you realize you're not alone and just trying to encourage people to to speak out to be the, the, the light in their city regardless of how alone they feel just to you know that's important for us to start stepping up and speaking out and uh, being willing to be these people who are going to change the world. And then we start to look at how this connects to our relationship to our family and friends. You know, a, a lot of people lose those relationships or they can become strained when they become really passionate about the, their newfound views. You know, it's difficult to get your family and friends to care about the things you care about often. So we look at how to deal with that and how to process that. And so that the first part of the book is like essays that are aimed on that uplifting and empowering people. And then the second half is called Tools for Action and it's more specific to giving people what we hope are tools to get them started on their journey. So there's a chapter on called What is Meditation and How Do I Meditate? And just explaining just that, you know, just um, the different forms of meditation that I've practiced. I also give five different meditation exercises in there for, that people can try and kind of change and adapt on their own. And then there's a chapter on positive affirmations and um, how positive affirmation and creative visualization can help empower your life. And again, these are like topics and ideas that might not be uh, the standard for the anarchist minded, but we're hoping that we're kind of bridging these worlds, and we've been finding out increasing these since these books have been uh, released. And you know, I just got rid of a bunch of books at Jackalope and talked to people there, and that you know, getting more people who are reaching out and saying, you know, I didn't think there was anybody out there that connected spirituality to anarchism. I'm glad that you guys are finally doing that, and so we're starting to see that there's you know this sort of subset of the movement, so to speak, that really aligns with these ideas. And uh, the third book that we're working on, which will be the, the mind, it'll be the brain of this philosophy. We've got the body, we've got the heart, and this is going to be the mind. Mm. We're currently working on it. It's untitled right now. But essentially, this is going to be a more like direct how-to book on how to create conscious agoras, how to create these communities. You know, we explore agorism in these books. We explore the philosophy. This is going to go even deeper into agorism, and really we're going to add you know, our own contributions. This is where John and I really are going to try to answer some really deep philosophical questions like can propertarians and non propertarians coexist in a panarchist world? You know, can we truly have that? Like how do we answer those questions? How can that be worked out? And we're going to work on our, our ideas and develop our theories on how to spread agorism through concepts like freedom cells that I've been pushing a lot recently and um, some other ideas. So this is going to be more uh, like you know, interesting for those who are probably interested in the philosophical discussions, the the actual political philosophy, and our own contribution to agorism. And we're really um, 
John and I are we're both just so open minded when it comes to the property question and we're we're kind of like, you know, we we understand that I think in, in a real free world most instances will probably be handled as individuals. You know, there's probably the, the problem is that we a lot of people are seeking some new one size fits all model when it comes to property, when it comes to how can a free world exist. But I think that more than likely the questions, those difficult questions of what about this, how do you deal with this, those will be answered in that moment by those people. You know, it might look different everywhere. You know, those answers might not all be the same everywhere. But we're going to attempt to really answer some of these questions, and we're thinking that we might have to come up with our own new name for whatever this school of thought that we're working on is, because we haven't seen what we're working on anywhere else, which is really exciting for us, because you know we want to be able to contribute to the the historical philosophy. And I and I, I I'm a nerd for the history. I love reading all of this stuff, and um, but I'm excited for that, man. Yeah, that's going to be the next one, which. We don't want to put any too hard deadline ourselves, but we have released each of them the last April. So if everything goes well, April 2017, the book three of The Conscious Resistance will be released. And uh, then after that, I'm going to start working on a fictional version of the, the ideas, turning yeah. them into a fiction book. Yeah. So that's, that's where we're at. And like I said, both those books, the first two are available to download for free. And I, I highly recommend everybody checking them out and contact us. Let us know what you think. You know, We get a lot of great feedback. It's been really fun to put this out there. Wow. So in other words, you guys are procrastinating, lazy anarchists that just don't get, get much done. <laughs> yeah, we're lazy. We, never, we just can't quite figure out how to settle down and get anything done. <laughs> you know, um, um, I, uh, I have a friend who, like, I, I hang out with a lot of homeschoolers because my kids are six and four, so we, uh, you know, we have a, a little homeschooling group around us, and, and so we meet up with a lot of homeschoolers and unschoolers. And, uh, and this one woman, um, she identifies herself as a, as a feminist in addition to an unschooler. And so we were talking about that a little bit. And, uh, and she was asking me if I think I'm a feminist <laughs> and I, and I tell her that, um, um, you know, it's, it's weird. It's like, if I were to identify every single group that I think, sh um, you know, ought to be, ought to be treated fairly and equally, like, what would I call myself? Like, um, I don't know, a uh, sexist or a uh, 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 blackist, uh, you know, Native Americanist. I don't know. What would I, you would have to identify everything. I'm like, I'm a humanist. I'm an individualist. I'm an anarchist. And I, and I told her that uh, the name of my website, Peaceful Anarchism, she's like, you're an anarchist? That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, what I wanted what I wanted to get at was that I told her about this book that I'm reading, the, the Conscious Resistance, and that the feminism chapter where you went into about Native Americans and how uh, they have um, you know in their culture not only two genders but like it's like multiple, and then there's one that embodies both, and then one that embodies none, and so and and that fascinated her, even though she doesn't call herself an anarchist. And I gave her the book, and and so I think she's read it, and I have yet to hear back from her about it. But um, but yeah, I thought that well, was really. I'd love to know how, what she thought of it, man. That's awesome. I appreciate you giving it out. Oh yeah, I mean, actually, to tell you the truth, I haven't even finished yet. I'm like halfway done, but I'm like, you sound like you would love this part, so I gave it to her, and she's like a big, a massive. She's a fast reader, like maybe like hundred books a week. She was telling me every every two weeks, so she's like, yeah, massive speed reader. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so um, so I don't want to keep you too long, but but please um, let people know where they can find your work. Just uh, plug your sites again, once again, before we go. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. It's been a fun conversation. Uh, the main place you can find the content that I do as far as uh, videos, vlogs, interviews, and stuff similar to this is theconsciousresistance.com, our YouTube, youtube.com slash consciousresistance. As far as my journalism, it's mostly all posted on activistpost.com, but you can stay plugged into derekbros.contently.com. I put every piece of content I create there. Um, and I mentioned a moment ago Freedom Cells. That's an idea that I'm really, really pushing, and I'll drop one more website for those who want to look more into that. It's freedomcells.coeo, C-O-E-O dot C-C. That's a new hub that we've created to allow people to connect and meet others in their own community to start building these ideas that we're talking about. So we just now started pushing that, and we're really going to be uh, working more on that over the next coming months. So anyone who's interested in that, please check that out and contact me. I love talking to people and meeting new people and discussing these ideas. Awesome. Yes, please, people, please contact him through his Facebook pages, buy his books, or just download them, you know, read his content. It's really awesome stuff. Spread the message. I think that's even more important than, than uh, you know, buying stuff or, or donating. It's just spreading the message because 
that's so much more powerful. It's contagious, right? Ideas are contagious, especially good ideas. <laughs> I mean, bad ideas are <laughs> contagious too, but but then again, they get defeated by good ideas, so it's no problem. You know, it's like the worst the worst thing you can do to, the worst thing you can do to bad ideas is suppress them, right? So you just let them, give them out, expose them to the light of day, and. Uh, and they will be uh, dealt with <laughs> uh, in in the way that they should. So so thanks a lot, Derek, uh, for the conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, so if anybody wants to donate to me, you can do so through Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism, or Bitcoin or PayPal. Uh, you can also uh, go to my website and purchase your uh, Amazon products through the Amazon affiliate links, uh, and I get a commission at no extra cost to you. Um, and it helps encourage me to do more of what I love doing best, which is in, uh, which is in interviewing fascinating people like Derek here. So so thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and TheConsciousResistance.com and TheSeedsOfLiberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.